We're going to be talking about the festivals of the Messiah, the Feast of the Lord, and the main text is Leviticus 23. How many of you have heard of Josephus? He lived in, during Christ's time, basically. Uh, in his works, he recorded that uh, Jerusalem's population was about 600,000 people at the time. During the festivals, because all the Jews from everywhere had to be there at Passover, there would be two and a half million people. They literally slew 250,000 lambs in one day. Can you imagine all of Pierce and King County in one little location back in those days? Two and a half million people. And it was a party. Uh, all, even Passover was meant to be a great festive time and a lot of joy. So I just wanted to put us for a moment back in that time frame to begin with. Now, do you think any of this took the Father by surprise? Don't you think he had this all planned from eternity? Is God in complete control? He's in his own foreknowledge, says, I'm going to determine what day my son dies. I'm going to determine what time he dies. I'm going to determine what songs are even sung at his funeral. And I'm going to begin from a Hebraic perspective to share with you things that you may not have known, uh, but it has been around in Judaism for over 3,000 years. One of the things you're going to see, how many of you remember at the Last Supper, it says they sang a hymn and went over to the Mount of Olives. Remember with that? You're going to find out today what words to that song. They've sung the same song for over 3,000 years. You're going to find out exactly what those final words were that they were singing just before he was betrayed and rejected. So there's all kinds of Hebrew roots I'm going to be ringing out today. But the most important one we're going to start with is from Leviticus 23, 1 and 2 on your notes. And there's a reason for that. Whenever we hear the word feast, what comes to our mind? Food. But that's a very inaccurate English translation. Those of you that have Strong's Concordances are going to be able to look this up. Leviticus 23, verse 1 and 2. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim, are holy convocations. Even these are my appointed feasts. Or even these are my feasts. So the word feast... Literally, in the Hebrew, it's Strong's number 4150, and it means moed, and it literally means an appointment. It's like God had a day timer, and he says, okay, I'm making all the feasts that I'm going to present to Israel are literally going to be appointments in history when I will intervene. It's a fixed time or a season, specifically a festival, to fix upon by agreement or appointment, by implication to meet at a stated time to engage for marriage. Okay, so don't you think it's an appoint, uh, important, if you're going to make an appointment with somebody, you both agree on when the appointment is? Especially if you're getting married, don't you think it'd be good if your spouse knew? <laughs> kind of a good idea. It's a bad thing if you're not there for the wedding. So it's fixed upon by agreement, and it's a stated time. So everyone is aware of when uh, the engagement is. So this is very important that we understand that. What this is here, these are the different time zones. Has anyone ever lived right on the border of a time zone? I used to live in Garden City, Kansas, right about here, worked down on Liberal. Several people had two clocks in their house. How would you like to live in one time zone and go five miles and live and work in another time zone? I'm serious. You, you never think of that unless you're actually living in those areas. People had two clocks. They literally lived in one time zone and worked in another time zone. That happens. Any city along these areas... It's like that. Unless you've experienced it, you have no idea. And so working in one time zone and living in another time zone can, you know, be complicated, but you need to do it, don't you? Well, I'm telling you, there's a biblical calendar and there is the calendar that we go by that, you know, Julius Caesar had clear back in Rome. Well, I want you to know God has a time zone and then there's our time zone, or God's calendar and our calendar. It is very important that the church as a whole understands the biblical calendar. We need the Julian calendar because that's where we live and where we work. But it's very important we understand God's calendar as well. Uh, you'll notice uh, in Genesis 1.14 on your notes it says, uh, this is in the very beginning, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. We understand for days and years, 
But what does it mean for signs and seasons? The word season there does not mean fall, winter, and spring, or summer. The word seasons there is the same word as feasts you saw in Leviticus 23. It's appointments. And the word signs there in the Hebrew is oath. And look what it means. It means in a sense of appearing, a signal. Remember the three wise men saw the signal, the sign in the sky? They knew the appointed time. So the, the sun, the moon, the stars are also signals to tell us of the appointed times. The next thing we saw in Leviticus 23, they were called holy convocations. Well, what does convocation mean? The Hebrew word is mikra. It means a dress rehearsal. If uh, any of you were in the play when you were growing up, you would always go through the dress rehearsals before the real performance so everyone would know what they were to do, right? Remember, Houston, we have a problem. And what would they say? Oh, let's go over everything. We've rehearsed all of this. Let's go over, you know, to make sure we got everything under control. Or even for a concert, uh, people, they always practice. Everyone knows their place. Well, the, these feasts, these appointed times, were dress rehearsals for the real performance. So for 1,500 years, the Jews killed the Passover lamb on Nisan 14, because 1,500 years later, the Passover lamb was going to die on Nisan 14. And we're going to talk about the rehearsals and what they went through. It's quite amazing. So if you'll notice here, this is Leviticus 23, verse 2 again, MBV. That's the Mark Biltz version. That's mine. But I, I, I'm putting the, a better definition in here for you. Speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, concerning the divinely appointed times of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy dress rehearsals, even these are for my divinely set appointments. Does that all of a sudden have a little bit better meaning than what you might have understood the first time before I explained this? This is why these are so important. God has divinely set in history not only the festivals for his first coming, but the festivals for his second coming. The word proclaim there, where it says, you shall proclaim it, the word comes from mikra, and it's just kara, and it, it means to call out to them that are bidden, to mention it, to publish it, to read it. So today, this is what I am doing. I am publishing, I'm mentioning, I'm just talking about proclaiming the festivals of the Lord so we can understand the importance of it. Uh, you'll see in, on your notes on Matthew 22, verse 3 and 4, this is in the, uh, the Brit Hadashah, or the New Covenant. It says, and he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I prepared my dinner. My ox and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. So this is that same concept. They were telling them, the wedding is ready. It's time to come. But can you believe it? There are people that did not want to come. And so we're going to take a look here at first at a Passover. In Leviticus 23, we'll move to verse 5 and 6 here. And it says, In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Now that reminds me of something I didn't mention that I want on the tape and I want on your notes. But Leviticus 23, 1 and 2, they were called the feasts of the Lord. And he said, even these are my feasts. He doesn't say they're the feast of the Jews. He doesn't say they're the feast of Israel. He says these are my feasts. And we see here, this is not the Jews' Passover, it's whose? It's the Lord's Passover. And if you belong to the Lord, Passover belongs to you. All the feasts belong to you. And then if you notice, there's a second day. On the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So we see there's Passovers on the 14th. And then on the 15th begins the feast of unleavened bread and it lasts seven days long. In Leviticus 23, 10 and 11, let's take a look at another feast. We just saw Passover and unleavened bread. And this is the next one. It says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you, and you shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. And look at when it is. It's supposed to be on the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So this is called the Feast of First Fruits. And in the spring, this was the barley harvest. And this feast literally fell within the Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
So uh, Nisan 14, you had Passover. Nisan 15 began the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then on Nisan 18 would have been the Feast of First Fruits on the morrow after the Sabbath that particular year. And so then after that, in Leviticus 23, verses 15 through 17 on your notes, then they said this, and you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day you brought the sheep of the wave offering, till seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number how many days? Fifty days. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals, and they shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now you notice the first one was unleavened bread. This one is leavened bread. What this is talking about is Pentecost. Many people don't realize the Jews kept Pentecost for 1,500 years before Pentecost. You can see right there, they were commanded. The word pente comes from 50. And they were commanded to count 50 days. Pentecost, the, the Jews were the first Pentecostals. <laughs> They've been Pentecostals for a lot longer than Pentecostals. As a matter of fact, to this day, how many Pentecostals keep Pentecost? The Jews still do. And they've been doing it for over 3,000 years. They've been doing it for 3,500 years. And we're going to be talking about what they do on the Feast of Pentecost as well. So we see in Deuteronomy 16, 16, it says, Three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose. And here he mentions it. In the Feast of Matzah. How many of you have heard of Matzah? That's the Hebrew word for unleavened bread. In the Feast of Matzah... And in the Feast of Shavuot is the Hebrew word for weeks. We have always called it Pentecost. The Jews have always called it Shavuot, which is the Hebrew word for weeks. And also in the Feast of Sukkot, or Tabernacles. And that some of these have different names, just like you may have different names. You may be called father, brother, son, husband. The feasts have different names also because they have great significant meaning, just like those titles have for you, have you know, the great significance to who you are. Again, I wanted to mention to you that there would be two and a half million people for these festivals. Two and a half million people would be at these. In Numbers uh, 9 on your notes, verse 2 and 3, it says, uh, Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. In the 14th day of this month, that even you shall keep it in his appointed season. Notice how many times he says that. According to all the rites of it and according to all the ceremonies thereof, shall you keep it. The reason why the Lord said that is because they were dress rehearsals. So he wanted them to do specific things. And it's only by knowing the rehearsals, the rites and the ceremonies that they did, will you really begin to see Messiah in the Feast of Passover and in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So let's take a look at what they did. Uh, right here, because it was unleavened bread, this is where the whole idea of spring cleaning came from. In every Jewish household for thousands of years, right before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, mom and the kids would literally get all the leaven out of the house. That's what they're doing. They would just clean everything and get it all nice and sparkling, and everyone's running around trying to get the leaven out of the house. And then we see in Exodus uh, 12, verse 15, you know, this is a painting of the Last Supper. You familiar with that? What do you see right here? It's a loaf of bread. He's not going to have a loaf of bread. This is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is a Greek Gentile concept of the Feast of Passover. That's a, these are things I want to bring up. He is not going to have a loaf of bread. He's going to have unleavened bread. He's going to have matzah. But these are the kind of things you begin to pick up. There's a whole bunch of other things that are wrong with this picture that we're going to be going over but I just wanted to give you an idea. You have to look through a Hebrew mindset if you really want to get a good understanding of what was going on at the time. And in uh, Exodus 12, 15, it says, Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day till the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. So do you think the Lord's going to be eating unleavened or leavened bread? I don't think so. 
In Exodus 13, 7, it says, uh, unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no leavened bread to be seen with you. Neither shall there be leaven seen with you in all your quarters. Another place says in all your coast. They literally, every home in every city was getting the leaven out of the house. Now, this is what is quite fascinating. What the father would do, they would want to make this really fun with the kids because they see the importance of getting the leaven out of the house and doing what God commanded. So the father would have a, a candle that he'd be want- They didn't have electricity back then. The father would have a candle and he would have a feather. You notice the feather. Mama would purposely hide a little bit of leaven after the whole house is cleaned by the oven in the kitchen. And all the kids would get together and they'd run around with dad to try to see if they could find any leaven left in the house. So one of the kids would be having a wooden spoon, another one a linen cloth, and they'd be going on their search. And finally they would, the father would have the candle and they'd see the leaven And then the father would take the wooden spoon and the feather, and he wouldn't touch the leaven. He would literally sweep the leaven onto his wooden spoon with the feather. Then they would wrap it into a linen cloth. And the leaven, uh, the candle, the feather, everything, and they would take it outside, and they would have a communal bonfire. All the neighbors would have done the same thing, and they would all have thrown their in this big pile, and they'd have a big, big bonfire the following day. Well, what is so significant about this... The candle represents the word of God. The feather, the Holy Spirit, sweeping the leaven onto the wooden spoon, the cross, wrapped in linen just like he was, taken outside the camp where he was a sacrificial offering. Every single little thing that they were doing was a dress rehearsal for what was to happen. You see on your notes, uh, Psalms 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Uh, you have the feather, Psalms 91, 4, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall trust. Uh, the wooden spoon in Deuteronomy 21, uh, referring to a, a body shall not remain all night on the tree, for he that is hanged is accursed. Uh, the leaven, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we see that uh, he knew no sin. He was unleavened. The linen cloth, Mark 15, we saw that they brought the linen cloth and they wrapped him in it. And then in Hebrews 13, 13, we see he was taken outside, outside of the camp. Now, look at this. How many of you remember when the Lord turned over all the money changers in the temple? Do you have any idea when that happened? You'll never forget it now. He was helping his dad get the leaven out of the house before Passover. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found the temple those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and he poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. You will never forget when that event happened now. You may not have known, but now you know he was helping dad get the leaven out of his house. You're going to see all these events from another perspective of what was really going on. So what do we see here on the top of page three? The search for leaven begins in his father's house. He's helping dad clean his house before the days of unleavened bread. Now, who are we? We are the house of God, aren't we? Uh, 1 Peter 2, 5, it says, uh, you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, we see that we are the temple of God. And so what does the Lord want to do in our lives, get the leaven out. Uh, we see there was leaven in the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2, he was talking about, uh, it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you. And you'll see in the middle of the notes there, he says, you are puffed up. That's what leaven does, doesn't it? It puffs up. And he says the last sentence, your glory is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And so what does it say in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 8? See that there? That's what matzah looks like. And if you'll notice, it is striped. If you'll notice, it is pierced. A lot of interesting things about matzah. But look what it says here in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 8. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are matzah. That's literally what it says in the New Testament. We are to be matzah. We're to be unleavened as well. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And then look what it says. Therefore, let us do what? Keep the feast. He wants us to keep the feast of Passover. And then we see in uh, Exodus 12, 3 through 6, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth 
of this month, they shall take each man a lamb for a house. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you shall keep it till the 14th day of the same month. So we see here that we have some different days here. On the 10th, they were to take the lamb, and they would hold it for how many days? Four days. From Adam to Christ was 4,000 years. The lamb was held for four days. If a day with the Lord is 1,000 years. Isn't that interesting? Now, what else do we see here? It says uh, in Exodus 12, verse 4, it says, If the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. They literally would count 10 people to a lamb. And that's where they get the two and a half million people because they slew 250,000 lambs on one Passover. Okay, there's your 10 souls to a lamb. Now, what's really interesting is now let's go to the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant. Let's look at John 12, 1 and 2. It says, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, so when is Passover? What day? Nisan 14. Think April. When you hear Nisan, think April. April 14th. If it's six days before the Passover, what day is it? It's the eighth. And what happened? Lazarus had just been uh, raised from the dead. And they made him a great supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Now, if you had just heard Lazarus was raised from the dead, wouldn't you like to go see him too? You know, I, I don't believe this. I want to go see this. Now, remember, this is the... Now, the days in Judaism starts at sunset, so this is the eighth going into the ninth in the evening of that day. So we've got to change our thinking a little bit here. So much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death. They're, the chief priests are so stupid, let's go kill him again. <laughs> you know, and like, hey, it doesn't, you know, he's just going to raise him from the dead again. So... On the morrow, so what is it now? If it says on the morrow, what do you have? The ninth going into the tenth. This is John 12, 12 through 13. On the morrow, a great multitude that came to the feast, having heard that Jesus does come to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palms and went forth to meet him and were crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who is coming in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now, here, here is what is interesting about that. Like I said, there was 250,000 lambs that would be coming into the temple. Here's a model of the temple, what it was like during Christ's time. It, this is west, the temple faced east. So here's the north, and here is the south. And uh, on Nisan 10, uh, all the sh sheep were basically raised in Bethlehem that were going to be used for the temple sacrifices. And Bethlehem is to the south. It almost touches Jerusalem. It's just like a stone's throw. And so on the 10th, at the very moment, the high priest is taking the lambs into the sheep gate, which is on the north, and the high priest literally would have a lamb, the Passover lamb for the nation with him. They would be singing uh, this psalm. This is Psalms 118. And look, at the, look what it says. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, that's Hebrew for save now, I beseech you, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech you, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. This is called the Hallel, where we get the word hallelujah from. Every one of the feasts, they would sing the Psalms, which is Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. That was their hymn book. So they are already singing that anyway, as the high priest is taking the Passover lamb into the temple. But what happens, the Lord is coming from Bethany, which is to the east, over the Mount of Olives, and he's going into the eastern gate. And at the same time, there's a group of people singing the same thing, but to him. So they were practicing it, rehearsing it, with the sheep's coming from the north, and here he's coming from the east, and that's why they're all upset, because they're singing it to him. And so what we see is the same day the Passover lambs are being brought into the temple, so is the Lord bringing brought into the temple. Very same day. And so we see in Mark 11, uh, 9 and 11 through 15, we see uh, those going before and those following cried out saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And on the next day, that's going to be the 10th of Nisan, right? And look what it says here. Again, he overthrew the tables. And so now it's the 10th going into the 11th of Nisan, and what happens? Now they inspect the lambs because they had to be without blemish, correct? So now we see the dress rehearsal of the inspection of the lamb. Look at this. 
they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him at his words. They begin to inspect the lamb for four days. Look at the next one. And now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. Again, the inspection of the lamb. He's going through that. Look at this on your notes, Luke 23. Even Pilate said, I have examined him before you and find no fault in him. Not even Herod did. So here we see he literally fulfills the lamb without blemish, without spot. And so now that brings us to the Seder service. This is more like how it was set up. Uh, what happens is this. Uh, in John 13, 23, on your notes, it says, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. They literally would sit on the floor, and more than likely, this is the shape of how they were in those days. And John, if you didn't know this, was the youngest disciple. The youngest disciple would always sit to the right, or just like the youngest child would sit to the right of the father. The oldest child would sit to the left of the father in a place of honor. So what that tells us is Judas Iscariot was the oldest disciple because uh, John was, or Yochanan set to his right. Here was Yeshua in Hebrew, which means salvation. So Mary literally was saying, come here, my salvation. Hey, everyone, I want you to be my salvation. That's what Yeshua means in Hebrew. So anyway, this is how it was set up. Peter more than likely would, would have been sitting over here on this side. But here the thing is, during every Passover Seder, the youngest child would always ask these four questions. One of the questions that they would ask is, why is this night different than all other nights? Now, don't you think that's significant that God, as a rehearsal, would make them ask, why is this night different from all other nights? Why on, a, on all other nights do we eat leavened or unleavened bread, but on this night only unleavened bread? Why on all other nights do we eat all kinds of herbs, but on this night only bitter? Uh, why on all other nights we never dip, but on this night we dip twice? And why on all other nights do we eat sitting, but on this night we recline? Do you know why they reclined? Because it was the whole concept of being out of Egypt in slavery. The slaves never could sit or recline. They had to stand to eat. So the very fact that they were reclining proved they were free men. So it wasn't just John reclining. They would all recline because that was the attitude of the Jews that we're free men. We can kick back and relax when we eat. In Exodus 12, 7 through 10 on your notes, it says that they will take of the blood and strike on the two side posts and upon the upper door post of the houses in which they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in that night. And look what it says. It's supposed to be roasted with fire and unleavened bread. And they shall eat it with bitter herbs. Don't eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted with fire, its heads, with its legs, its inward parts. And you shall not let any of it remain till the morning, and that which remains of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. So why was it roasted? Well, that speaks of Yeshua's sacrifice. Okay, he was the burnt offering. Why not boil it in water? We're not to water down the word of God. Why unleavened? He was without sin. Why was it eaten with bitter herbs? Just because of the bitterness of the experience that he had to go through. And why the following morning was it burned with fire? Again, because he was that sacrifice. And why did they recline at the Seder? Because they were free men. This is a sample of the Seder tray, and I do have a Seder tray up here you can look at when we're done. But what's so interesting is, you know, the shank bone obviously spoke of the sacrificial lamb. The bitter herbs, you know, had to do with uh, being in bondage, the reminder of bitterness, not only of them being in bondage, the bitterness of being in bondage, but the Lord's sacrifice that he had to go through. Uh, the haroset is a special uh, dessert made of apples, nuts, and cinnamon, and uh, some people said it was like the mortar that built the pyramids is what it uh, typified. But also is that reminds us that if we press on with God during our difficult times, you'll eventually begin to taste the sweetness of God in your life. Uh, you had romaine lettuce, or uh, uh, it reminds us of our days in Egypt and worldly experiences. Uh, the parsley, the parsley is to be dipped in salt water. The thing that, that the parsley symbolizes was the hyssop that was dipped into the blood and put on the doorpost. I don't know if you knew this, but the lambs were literally slain under the doorpost. There was a trench to keep water out of the house. And so the blood literally was in a trench in front of the doorpost. 
And they would take the hyssop and put it on it, and that's what the parsley was to be a reminder of. And then the egg was a reminder of the additional lamb. Uh, there was another lamb that was slain. If they needed more lambs, they could have another lamb that they would kill. Uh, uh, the roasted egg also represents the destruction of the temple. Anyone remember what year the temple was destroyed? Uh, 70 AD, but how about the first one? That's Herod's temple. How about Solomon's temple? About 587. I don't know if you knew this, but the temple was destroyed in 587 BC on the ninth day of the month of Av. In 70 AD, the temple was destroyed on the ninth day, ninth day of the month of Av. Same day. Do you know why they were both destroyed on the same day? It was on the ninth day of the month of Av, the ten spies gave the bad report of the land. Not only that, in the year 1290, all the Jews were kicked out of England on the ninth of Av. In 1492, all the Jews were kicked out of Spain on the ninth of Av. World War I started on the ninth of Av. Hitler's proclamation to kill the Jews happened on the ninth of Av. And they just expelled all the Jews out of Gaza at sunset on the ninth of Av. You only see these things on a biblical calendar. You will not see them on our calendar. You don't connect the dots, which is why you want to be on a biblical calendar so you understand when things happen, this is a God thing. It's not just random. And so you see the parsley, the matzah. The parsley is the hyssop dipped in tears of the basin of blood. Matzah is the sinless Messiah we partake of. The bitter herbs, his experience, the shank bone, the lamb that was sacrificed, the roasted egg, the temple's destruction, and the heroset, the sweetness of being delivered. So let's look at Exodus 6, 6 and 7. Okay, I don't know if you knew this, but a lot of people, when you think of the Passover Seder, you think of them only drinking one cup. You see the, the, the wine and the matzah. There were four cups. There's always been four cups. And you're going to see this in a minute, and each one had great significance. It's all based on this verse. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and here comes the first cup. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. That's the second cup. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. That's the third cup. And with great judgments. And then the fourth cup, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. So those are what the four cups are. And I'm going to explain them to you here in a minute. Right here it says, then he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. That's Luke 22:17. But look what a few verses later say. And then verse 20 it says, likewise also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So you see right there, there were at least two cups, the cup before supper and the cup after supper, but actually there were four. So the first cup is called the cup of sanctification. And this is where he says, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Uh, aren't we grateful that he brought us out from under the burdens of the world? Amen. Okay, what that basically speaks of is how the Lord has freed us from the yoke of burdens and the cares of this world. He wants to take off our load. Imagine you're an Egyptian slave and you have this heavy load, and he takes those burdens off. That's great, okay, but what's the problem? You're still chained, and you're still in Egypt. So the first cup of sanctification is these, sanctification basically means to set apart. And so we set them apart, and he removed their load. In Exodus 4, 22 and 23 on the top of page 6, it says, and you shall say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto you, let my son go that he may serve me. And if you refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay your son, even your firstborn. So this is a battle of firstborns. Now, how many of us know we can't serve two masters? Isn't that what it says? Well, the word serve in Hebrew is abad. And what it literally means is to be a worshiper. So he's literally saying, as long as they're in Egypt, they can't worship me. They can only worship Pharaoh. So if he wanted to be worshipped, he had to set them free from worshipping Pharaoh or serving Pharaoh. So more than just responding to their woes, God wanted their worship. So God chose them, he separated them, and remember, he did that while they were still in Egypt, which represents the world. And then the next clip is the cup of deliverance. So now he says, I will rescue you from their bondage. So not only does he take the load off, he breaks the chains as well. That's tying them to Egypt. And he needs to break the chains that tie us to this world as well. So the Lord not only lifted off the yoke, but he also broke the chains that tie us to the world. Uh, the word bondage here is the same form as abad before, but it's uh, abodah, and it means work of any kind. 
And we know from Romans 6.16 that who we yield ourselves servants to obey, that's whose servants we are to whom we obey. And so he wants us not to serve the world, but to serve him. So now we see their load has been removed, their ankle chains are broken, but they're still not free until what? God pays their redemption price. They still are in Egypt, aren't they? They got the loads taken off, the chains are broken, but they're still in Egypt. So they need to be what? They need to be purchased. They need to be redeemed. And so that brings us to the next cup, which is the third cup. And in Jewish history, the third cup is always known as the cup of redemption. And this is where he says, I will what? Redeem you with an outstretched arm. What, how is that? It doesn't say hand. And it doesn't just say arm, it says an outstretched arm. What comes to your mind when you think of an outstretched arm? I mean, that's a lot of force. That's a lot of power, like throwing a baseball or hitting a bat. I mean, you, it's an outstretched arm. Well, look at Jeremiah thirty-two seventeen. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heaven and the earth by your great power, and what? And there is nothing too hard for you. Now, when you think about creation, uh, all the awesome power... And look at the, the net worth. How many billions and trillions of dollars is all the minerals worth? If you had all the gold and all the oil and all the silver and all the ore, not only here, but on every single planet throughout the whole universe, how much value would there be? Unimaginable. And yet, what did God make that out of? Nothing. Was there any cost to God for this? There was absolutely no cost at all. So what price was paid for the creation of the universe? There was none. And yet redemption, it says, took the same extension of God's power, but look at what cost. What does that say how much you're worth versus all of the creation? Which is why we need to put a greater value on people instead of things. Think about that. Look at this next clip. He says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. That's literally what he did. With his outstretched arms, that's what he redeemed us. And it, at a great price, at a great price. Uh, it says he took bread and he gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The other thing I want to bring out is the matzotash in the afikoman bag. Uh, the interesting thing about, has anyone ever here been to a Seder before? I know some of you have. Let me show this to you. This is the matzotash bag. It has uh, three compartments. They would put, they hide matzah, or they put matzah in this bag. During the Seder service, they take the middle matzah out. Isn't that interesting? You got the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. They take the Son. They take that middle matzah out, and what do they do? They break it. And remember, the matzah speaks of who? And then what do they do? They break it. And then they put it in an afikoman bag. This says afikoman. And then they, the father will hide it somewhere in the house. So here the matzah, which is striped and pierced, is broken, wrapped in linen, hidden away. At the third cup, the cup of redemption, it comes back out and it is found. They do that every year at Jewish seders. And you know what afikoman means? I came. Isn't that fascinating? The fourth cup is known as the cup of acceptance, where he says, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Aren't you glad the Lord has decided to take you? So the fact that God paid a great price for you should let you know how much he treasures you. In Ephesians 1, 4 through 7, on your notes, you'll find all four cups mentioned there. You'll see where he's, you've been chosen. Uh, you're going to see where you've been holy and without blame before him. Uh, you've been delivered. Uh, he's made us accepted. That's the fourth cup. And in whom we have redemption, the third cup. So in Ephesians 1, 4 through 7, you really literally see all four cups in the Seder service that was mentioned. Now let's go look at uh, Mark 14, 26. It says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Guess what the words were that they sang right before he was betrayed and rejected by men. Remember what psalms do they sing at every feast? Psalms 113 through Psalms 118 is called the Hallel. 
So Psalms 118 would have been the last hymn they sang. So what are the very final words they were singing before he was betrayed and rejected? I will praise you for you have heard me and you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Now what's the Hebrew word for salvation? Yeshua. Okay. And now let's look at what the next verse goes on to say. God is the Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even to the horns of the altar. Those are the words they're singing right before he is betrayed. And then we see in Mark 15, it says, And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of who? There they are, Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And it was what time was it? Do you realize the third hour is what time in the morning? Nine in the morning. That's the time of the morning sacrifice. The very moment they were binding the Passover lamb to the horns of the altar, they were binding Yeshua to the cross. It's a dress rehearsal. It's a dress rehearsal. They're binding Yeshua to the cross the same time the Passover lamb is being bound to the altar. And then in Matthew 27, on your notes here, it says, from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Okay, the sixth hour is what time? And the ninth hour is, and if you look on your notes on Acts 3, 1, it says, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, being what? The, so here we see the sixth hour, and then we see the ninth hour, and so we see the ninth hour is an hour of prayer as well. So it was, you know, before he was crucified as well as after he was crucified. And then in John 19:30. It says, when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. Well, the ninth hour is what time? Three in the afternoon? That's the time of the evening sacrifice. So the very moment the high priest slew the Passover lamb, that's when the Lord died. Dress rehearsal. So they were going through the entire dress rehearsals because they were appointed times. And the high priest, when he would slay the Passover lamb, would say, it is finished. The lamb for the nation. Passover is over. But see what else they were singing in Psalms 118. Look at these. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my Yeshua. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. Now, is not the Lord at the right hand of the Father? The right hand of the Lord does mighty things. The right hand of the Lord is what? He's lifted up. That's what they're singing. The right hand of the Lord does mighty things. Isn't that cool? In John 6, 35, uh, it says, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, and he that comes to me shall never hunger, but he that believes on me shall never thirst. In Matthew 2, 1, it says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Does anyone know what Bethlehem means in Hebrew? It's two words, bat lachem. It means house of bread. So the bread of life was born in the house of bread. I'm sure that was just coincidence. In Leviticus 23, 5 through 6, we touched on this. And this is where it says the 14th day of the first month that even was the Lord's Passover. Then it says the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In seven days they must eat unleavened bread. We know that Messiah was unleavened or without sin. We see that in Hebrews 4, 15, where it says, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So we see he was unleavened. So I've, I've gone through the Feast of Passover, and you saw how he fulfilled the Feast of Passover. Now we're looking at the 15th, how he fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th. Uh, Psalm 16.10, it says, You will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your holy one to what? See corruption. Do you remember in the first, uh, the first Passover, they died, all the firstborn of Egypt died on the 14th, and the next day they buried their firstborn, and the next day the father buries his firstborn on the 15th. So we see here the same day God buried his firstborn son was also the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, why is the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days long? 
And immediately, first you have Passover, which is a separate holiday almost, and then you have seven days. Well, there's an interesting parallel. In Revelation 13, it talks about the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And so in God's mind, you have that happen. Then you have the seven days of creation. A thousand years is the day. You have the, the 7,000th millennial reign is about to begin. It's been 4,000 years from Adam to Christ, 2,000 years from Christ till now. We're about to enter the seventh day or the day of rest. In Genesis 2, 2 and 3, it talks about how on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made and he rested. So we see they departed from Ramesses in the first month and on the 15th day of the first month, on the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand on the side of the Egyptians. For the Egyptians did what? They buried their firstborn. And so we see on the very same day that Egypt buried their firstborn, the father's firstborn is also in the grave. But let's take a look at the next clip, Matthew 28, 1. You notice here it says, At the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came uh, to see the sepulcher, right? Well, what festival is this now? Let's go look at Leviticus. When you come to the land which I give to you, you shall reap the harvest thereof. Then you shall bring a sheaf, which in the Hebrew word is omer, of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on you. And when is that done? On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And what do we see on the morrow after the Sabbath? Christ became the first fruits of the resurrection at the very moment the high priest is waving the first fruits of the barley harvest. We see Yeshua is the first fruits of the resurrection, fulfilling the feast of first fruits. The word for a Hebrew word for sheaf is omer, and we see that a sheaf can represent people. We see that in Psalms 126.6, He that goes forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. But now Christ is risen from the dead, and he has become what? The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light to the people, to the Gentiles, Acts 26.23. So not only did he fulfill Passover on Passover, not only did he fulfill unleavened bread on unleavened bread, now at the first fruits of the barley harvest, when the high priest is literally waving the first fruits, he is the first fruits of the resurrection. And first fruits has always been a major theme throughout the Bible. We see in Deuteronomy 26 that uh, all the first of all the fruit of the earth belong to uh, God. And what do we know of Yeshua? He was the first begotten of Mary. He was the first begotten of God. He was the firstborn of every creature, the first begotten of the dead, the firstborn of many brethren, first fruits of the resurrected ones, beginning of the creation of God, and he's the preeminent one. And so here, literally, he is the first fruits fulfilling the feast of first fruits on the feast of first fruits. Not the day before, not the day after. And then we also see that we follow. In Matthew 27, verse 51 through 53, is where it says, Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top and the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. And he went into the holy city and appeared to many. And so we see the first and the best sheaf of barley was harvested and brought to the temple as a thanksgiving offering to the Lord of the harvest. Now here's the important thing to realize. That first sheaf was a representative of the whole harvest. It served as a pledge that the rest of the harvest would be realized, which is why, because he rose from the dead, we know we will raise from the dead as well. Now, the interesting thing, too, is, is the th term harvest. In Luke 10, 2, it says, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, he would send forth laborers into the harvest. So uh, Israel was an agricultural society. And God had them be that way because he wanted to, them to get the concept of the natural harvest and a spiritual harvest, a harvest of souls. And he wanted to make it simple. So now the next thing that that brings us to on the top of page 10 is the counting of the omer. The Hebrew word is omer, the Greek or the English word is sheaf. And look at what it says. And you shall what? Count unto you from the what? Morrow after the Sabbath. 
So right after first fruits, they were to count. From the day you brought the omer or the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number how many days? Fifty. And that's where they got the word Pentecost from. They've been keeping Pentecost forever, for 1,500 years. We've been keeping the 4th of July for 200. They've been keeping Pentecost for 1,500 years before Pentecost. Does anyone know when the first Pentecost was? It was the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. Here you have the giving of the law, and then you have the giving of the Spirit. You end up finding not too long after the giving of the law, 3,000 died. And at the giving of Pentecost, you have 3,000 saved. Coincidence, I'm sure. (laughs) We see here that it was uh, called... Seferet ha omer. Seferet is counting, ha is the, omer is sheaf. They literally would count how many days until then, and every day was very significant for them. Counting in anticipation of an exciting event is quite understandable. How many of you, before your birthday, when you were little, would count how many days until your birthday? Or how many days until you're going to Disneyland, or whatever it is, some significant event you would count? At one time or another, we probably said something like, Grandma's coming to visit in a week and a half, or only 17 more days till my birthday. But here's one subtle difference. The the usual method of counting is to count down. 10, 9, 8, 7, like a rocket. Here you don't count down, you count up. They would count. This is the first day of the Omer. This is the second day of the Omer. This is the third day. So they're counting up to the 50th day. The answer for this is that the Jews were not yet spiritually equipped to receive the Torah. And so for over 200 years, they've been living in Egypt in an Egyptian society known to be the world's center for immorality and vice. And what's interesting is this high impact adventure of the Exodus. Can you imagine this? 10 miraculous plagues, the splitting of the Red Sea, launched the Jews into physical freedom. But what's amazing is any experience, no matter how powerful as it is, does not permanently change your character. That is only possible through practice and adjustment over time and God. So why did God wait 50 days after the Jews left Egypt before giving him the Torah? Why didn't he give him the Torah while they were still in Egypt? Because Egypt represents the world. Isn't this true? You can take the people out of Egypt, but you can't get Egypt out of the people? That's a whole other ballgame. Think of wealthy people you might have heard about that steal stuff from stores. You know what happens. Or people who attend a seminar and they get all psyched up, but there's no permanent change in their life. You know, they're all psyched up for a few days. Leviticus 25, 8 and 9, it says, You shall number seven Sabbaths of years unto you, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto you 49 years, and you shall cause the trumpet of Jubilee to sound. Isn't that interesting? You keep seeing the number seven. Seven days of creation, seven days for the feast of Passover, and then seven weeks, seven times seven is 49, and then the jubilee year is sounded at the end of the 49 years. In a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about Yom Kippur. But on, remember in the Gospels where the Lord stood up and he quoted Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach liberty to the captives and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord? I can tell you what day he did that. Because Leviticus 25, you can only proclaim the year of Jubilee on Yom Kippur. So when he did that, he was proclaiming the year of Jubilee. What a way to begin his ministry. But that was probably a coincidence too. So why do we count the Omer? Well, God told us to. Okay? Beginning on the day that the first Omer of barley was harvested and brought to the temple, a countdown to the next biblical festival began. The Israelites were commanded to count off 49 days and then celebrate the festival of Shabbat, which means Pentecost, on the 50th day. So traditionally, the period of the Omer count is to be a time of spiritual introspection as the counters prepare themselves for Shabbat. Now, because it always begins during Passover and concludes at Pentecost or Shavuot, it is always a remembrance of their journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai, because it was at Mount Sinai that they received the Torah. And so to remember of our journey from this world into uh, the resurrected life of walking in the Messiah, uh, we need to realize that. It's also an expectation of a coming harvest and asking God to prepare us for it. Remember this 
Passover is which harvest? Which grain? Barley. It's the barley harvest. And Pentecost is the wheat harvest. And so the counting of the Omer is a countdown to the next harvest. Uh, it's the time of the giving of the Holy Spirit. So it's a journey which begins, begins at uh, Passover, which is the symbol of what? Our salvation in Yeshua. And then it's completed with the receiving of the Torah and the Holy Spirit. Uh, so the distance between these two events should be a time when we should actually reflect, you know, on what God is doing in our life. And the very fact that the Lord uh, rose during the counting of the Omer makes it uh, of special significance. Uh, did you know that all of his post-resurrection appearances and his ascension fell within the days of the Omer count? Some people think the Jews were just off doing their own thing. No, they were commanded to count the Omer. Every day they would count the Omer how many days till Pentecost. Uh, and we see in, on the very first day of the Omer, uh, that's when he appeared to Miriam and uh, two of our number while they traveled to Emmaus, it says. And then in John 20, uh, we see Mary Magdalene came and told his disciples that she had seen the Lord. Uh, that was the, being the first day of the week. And then on the ninth day of the counting of the Omer, he appeared again to Thomas. Uh, and then in John 20, eight days after that, uh, again his disciples were within and the Lord appeared to them. But see, realize the counting of the Omer is going on as he's appearing. Uh, then in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, after that, he was seen above of 500 brethren at once. So he was seen of all kinds of people, but it was all during the counting of the Omer. Uh, we even see in John 21, uh, that's when he appeared to seven while they were out fishing. Everyone's familiar with that. What day did he ascend? The 40th day. We see that in Acts. So, but realize it's not just the 40th day, it's the 40th day of the counting of the Omer. See, that's why that is so significant. <clears throat> in Acts 1, we see that that's where the Lord appeared to them, and he told them they should not depart from Jerusalem. They probably were scared to death thinking they should book, but they know they had to be in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. <laughs> God had commanded all the Jews to be in Jerusalem three times a year. They had to be in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, but they were scared and wanting to leave. And he says, no, everything's going to be fine. I want you to stay in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And then Acts 1, 9, that's when he literally ascended into heaven. It was on the 40th day. And so now I want you to get into a Hebrew mindset here and see they, they waited. They were counting the days. Okay, 41, 42, 43, 44, you know, as they're counting up. And then it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, we were all together in one place. Why do you think they were all together in one place? They were commanded to be together in one place. Not only them, but all the Jews were commanded to be in Jerusalem. All two million, two and a half million of them. So it was very important to count the Omer uh, and make the Omer count. And then let's look at Numbers 48. It says in Numbers 28, verse 26, so this is the Hebrew word for Shavuot or Pentecost. It says, also in the day of the first fruits, when you bring a new made offering unto the Lord, after your weeks be out, or after the seven weeks, then you have to have a holy convocation and do no work. So Passover is the first fruits of barley, Pentecost is the first fruits of wheat, and they're to have a holy convocation. And what does convocation mean? Okay, so here we go. Now they're having a dress rehearsal. So what are they doing? Deuteronomy 16, again, in Deuteronomy 16, 16, it says this, three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose, in the feast of Matzah, in the feast of Shavuot, and in the feast of Sukkot, or tabernacles. So we see again, they've been keeping Pentecost for 1,500 years. But let's look at this next clip. What are they to do? They're to bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two-tenth deals. They should be a fine flour. They should be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. So now these are baked with leaven. So what do these two leavened wave loaves speak of? Jew and Gentile. We're still with sin. We're still leavened. And so what do we see happening? Uh, let's go to the next one. See what the high priest was to do. On Pentecost, the priest would wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord. So they would take those two wave loaves and they would wave them. Uh, with two lambs. And they'll be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be what? A dress rehearsal. And so, what do we find? Let's go to the next clip. In Acts 2, 1 through 5, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, from where? 
And why were they there? They were commanded to be there. That's why they were there. They've been meeting there for 1,500 years. This is nothing new. And what does it say on the next clip? And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each one of them. Now, you know what's interesting about that? Let's look at the next verse. These are not drunken as you suppose. It is what? The what? Which is the time of the what? The very moment the high priest is waving the two leaven wave loaves as the dress rehearsal, that's when the Holy Spirit is poured out. But I'm sure that's just a coincidence. Are you seeing a pattern of dress rehearsals here that they have been going through? As a matter of fact, let's look at the next verse. In Exodus 23, 14 through 16, Again, three times you shall keep a feast unto me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread and the feast of harvest. So as you remembered, it was called Shabbat, which means weeks. Here's another name. It's called Hag Hakatsur in Hebrew, which is the feast of the harvest. And then the feast of ingathering refers to Sukkot. So the feast of Pentecost was to be a big harvest. And what do we see? Then they that gladly were received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's a pretty good harvest, would you think? Let's look at the next clip. As a matter of fact, in Acts 4, it goes on to say, How be it many of them which heard the word believed, the number of them was now what? 5,000. Let's look at the next verse. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said to him, You see, brother, how many tens of thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they're all zealous for Torah. Sounds like a pretty good harvest. These were dress rehearsals. What's really interesting is this next verse here. Now, if you remember, when was the first Pentecost? The giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. That was the first Pentecost. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and they heard the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that everyone in the camp trembled. And Mount Sinai was all together and spoke uh, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Are we seeing a connection here? Okay. Do you know the Jews for thousands of years would read Exodus 19 on Pentecost? The Jews literally stay up all night long reading different books of the Bible. And what's very interesting is the rehearsal of what they were reading. This is one of the chapters they were reading about how the Lord comes down in fire. Let's look at what else they read. They always read the book of Ezekiel. And so what are they reading? And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. A whirlwind? A great cloud and fire enfolding itself? And brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof is the color of amber out of the midst of the fire? And the Spirit took me up. Hmm, I wonder if the Spirit has anything to do with this. And I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing. That's in Ezekiel now, we're not in Acts saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. I also heard the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touch one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them, and the noise of great rushing. And what do we see in Acts 2? Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them cloven tongues like as of fire, and sat on each one of them. That's what they've been reading for 1,500 years for the Feast of Pentecost. And let's look at the next one. Ezekiel 36 is where he says, a new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I'm going to take away the stony heart out of your flesh. So the first Pentecost, the Torah came on tablets of stone. This, the fulfillment, he puts the Torah on our hearts. And so Isaiah 24, we're almost done. It says, the earth also was defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they've transgressed the Torah. They've changed the ordinance. They broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. And then in Psalms 119.53, it says, Horror has taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake your Torah. It is time for you, Lord, to work, for they have made void your Torah. The other thing that they do in this next clip, look at this. They always read the book of Ruth. And look what it says. She kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So it's talking, the barley harvest speaks of what? Passover. The wheat harvest speaks of what? Pentecost. 
And what does the book of Ruth speak of? Jew and Gentile coming together. One new man working the harvest, bringing forth the Messiah. And what is quite fascinating is this. Uh, Ruth in Hebrew means friend. And she became a friend of Israel and went and worked the harvest. Orpah, the other lady, Orpah means to turn the back of the neck in Hebrew. They both were Gentiles. They both represent the last day's church. The dividing line is going to be how you treat Israel. The church that befriends Israel is like Ruth and brings forth the Messiah and works the harvest. Orpah is the Gentile church who turns her back on Israel and goes back to her gods. And then the next clip. Here we see this. Another angel, this is in Revelation 14, 18. Another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. I don't know if you notice anything, but here we're talking about what harvest now? Not wheat, not barley, but what? Fruit. And the fruit harvest is in the seventh month. Catch this. This is what this all comes down to. Do you see the patterns? Do you see the dress rehearsals? Just as the spring feasts were the dress rehearsals for Messiah's first coming, the fall feasts are the dress rehearsals for his second coming, the events will happen on those days. Do you catch that? There were three spring feasts. Passover, was Passover fulfilled on Passover? Was unleavened bread fulfilled on unleavened bread? Was first fruits fulfilled on first fruits? Was Pentecost fulfilled on Pentecost? There are three fall feasts. That's what these next three-week series are. I wanted to lay the groundwork first. And look at this last clip. Is he not the same yesterday, today, and forever? If he fulfilled the spring feast to the day, he's going to fulfill the fall feast to the day. And the church does not understand the second coming of the book of Revelation until they look at it from a Hebraic perspective because the events will happen on those days. They will happen in that order. 